Start us off, Callum. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Cast Pod Conservation. Today, we are going to be talking about uh, a topic that I am super interested in. I've always been interested in it. Um, and Kevin also has expressed quite a bit of interest in this topic. Mm-hmm. I would say it's fun, but it's not really fun. It's kind of a serious thing. But uh, I don't know, there's just a lot to say about it. You know, Today, that topic is invasive species. So would you like to give us a little bit of an introduction about invasive species? Sure. So invasive species is non-native animals found typically found in an area that they're not traditionally found in. Mm-hmm. So um, with that, it's it doesn't matter what kind of organism it is. Did I say animal? I apologize. It could be also plants as well and fungus, That's bacteria, true. pretty much any yeah, living kind thing. of life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's any living thing that's found in a non-native spot. And typically they do not have any natural born predators in that area. And mm-hmm. without the natural born predators and, or things that will naturally take care of their defense mechanisms, their population goes unchecked. And it can cause massive growth in populations and do things such as destroying entire ecosystems, running entire other species out of the area, and even harming humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, just kind of a summary of that. Like Kevin said, it's an organism that's not where it's supposed to be, and it is harmful. That is kind of the main two points of being an invasive species because there's also non-native species Mm -hmm. uh, like non-native versus versus invasive is that you can have a species that is in an area that doesn't really do anything like they're not supposed to be there but also they're not really causing any problems and that would be non-native while invasive is like they're there and they're messing things up Mm -hmm. they're there Um, to stay get used to it exactly so i think the goal of this is to kind of educate people about you know invasive species kind of how prevalent they are um one of my kind of pastimes is going out into the field with people that might not really know much about uh animals or nature in general and you know show them a bunch of things and be like that's not supposed to be here this thing's from china this is from japan this is from blah 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 it's like you would have never known if you hadn't like stopped to identify them and be like, there's a lot more invasive species here than you might think. Mm-hmm. And then something to counteract Callum, because we mm-hmm. both have very mostly similar thoughts on things such as invasive species and stuff. But I did a lot of I did my research and my prep for this episode. Mm. on thinking from good old Jimmy Bag of Donuts point of view, who is my little fictional character that does not follow pretty much thinks the opposite point of view. He's a businessman, you know? A little devil's advocate. A little little devil's advocate. He's uh, in the oil industry, first off. Oh, Oh, yeah. He's he's not not the most pleasant job you thought of a whole background for this guy like jimmy bag of donuts he also has a wife and three kids wow good for him jane bag of donuts jimmy jr bag of donuts jenny bag of donuts and then greg oh yep does greg not get a last name no (laughs) oh they can only afford four four last names jeez (laughs) all right then um, and what kind of stuff is uh, he going to be talking about? So he's going to be going into things a little bit on aren't there some benefits to invasive species as mm. well as what truly constitutes an invasive species and how specific or unspecific it can be. All right. I like that because mm-hmm. I, I definitely was planning on bringing up similar things about you know, what 
really defines an invasive species. So I think we might as well just jump right into it. All right. Um, I have quite a bit of experience uh, dealing with invasive species. Not really any sort of projects like trying to remove them or anything, but just because they've always been an area of interest for me, I've done quite a bit of research on various different invasive species, a lot of school projects that I've done. Like in, I believe it was 10th or 11th grade, I did a presentation on invasive species in the U.S. where I basically just brought up like whole list of uh, different invasive species that I was aware of and their kind of impacts. And you know, just, to, just to show people, like I said, you know, a lot of people don't realize what an invasive species is or like how many they're, they might see day to day. Um, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And I will say, uh, you know, more of an animal background. So that's more of what I know. I know there's tons and tons of invasive plants oh, yeah. around here as well, all around all over the place. Um, but I'm nowhere near as adept as, uh, calling those out as I am with the, with the animals. So that's kind of what I'll be focusing on. Maybe I'll mention some things here and there, like I know multiflora rose is a big one. Um, and there's a uh, Japanese knotweed, which honeysuckle. I've seen a lot of. Um, honeysuckle. Yeah, honeysuckle. Mm. So um, top, go on. the top six um, invasive plants are oh, okay. uh, purple loosestrife, or hmm. according to this article, they are purple loosestrife, Japanese honeysuckle, nice. Japanese barberry, Norway hmm. maple, English oh. ivy, uh, kuzu, and hmm. kuzu is number six. Oh. And, and that shows my knowledge with the plants because I am not familiar with like any of those, except for honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. So... English ivy is one that you're pretty much guaranteed to see. It's a very low forming ivy that tends to climb and go over a lot of plants and is used. Uh, uh, I'm looking at it now. Yeah, I've definitely seen that. Yeah. You'll definitely recognize it if you see it. And it's, it's the like very aggressive one where if you hear of a plant strangling another plant, like strangling a tree, mm -hmm. uh, it could be English ivy. Yeah, in the U.S. at least. Mm -hmm. I don't know about other countries, but uh, yeah. So I'll definitely focus more on the animals, but mm -hmm. it is good to know for that stuff. Yep. And I, I think, um, like the ones that I come across most often, um, well, in the news there have been quite a few, mm -hmm. right? Uh, recent in the recent years, we I think the news has picked up on a lot of invasive species yep. and brought them to people's attention. Probably one of the biggest ones most recently would be the um, lanternflies, the spotted lanternflies. Oh, yeah. That's definitely at least here on the East Coast. This is yeah. becoming a lot more prevalent every single um, summer. Yeah, because I think more and more people are starting to see like, oh yeah, they really are spreading. Because, I mean, last year, uh, I never really saw them. Um, yeah. I would see them in different parts of the state, and I would hear about other people saying, like, oh, yeah, back home, they're all over the place. And I'd be like, oh, thank God they're not here. And then this year, now I'm seeing them all over the place. Now they're, like, it's... in my neighborhood. Um, so it's very obvious, like, yeah, they, they're they really spread. spreading. Mm -hmm. And it's sad to see. Um, because a lot of times with invasive species, the problem is they grow so fast or like they multiply and there's, it feels like there's nothing you can really do yeah. because there's just so many that it's like, well, how, how would we ever possibly get rid of all these? So really shout out to all of the workers out there who are on those kinds of projects trying to deal with that because it is a really, really a big task to try and handle. Um, but yeah, spotted lanternfly is a big one. Another one that I don't 
even know if I would consider an invasive species yet mm-hmm. would be the Japanese giant hornets, or as the media refers to them, the murder hornets. Murder hornets, yes. Yeah. The, <laughs> they seem to be pretty contained in their invasiveness at the moment. From what I can tell, yeah. Because but... we've, we've found the one colony that was all vacuumed up. Because mm-hmm. um, initially, from the research that I had done, uh, it was only noticed that, like, I think maybe six individuals in the past, like, ten years had been found. Yeah. Only in the state of Washington and, like, parts of Nova Scotia. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that doesn't surprise me at all because you're going to get lots of shipments from Asia, specifically, like, Japan and China, because Japan is where they're coming from, um, coming over to those areas of the U.S. So I would not be surprised at all that some insect comes off of there and you know just ends up in that area because that's pretty much where a lot of them have come from i mean the many more of them have spread across the u.s that we don't talk about that often yeah but this one in particular even though it didn't really make that big of a deal like as far as numbers that we know of um really got a lot of attention and I think I think it's good to show people like show the like common people that these things are happening that like uh these, this is more common than you would think occurrences. Yeah. I think it's it's better to let people see it. Um but also I don't know if like the overhyped hysteria that can come from it is a good, good. thing or a bad thing yeah so because a murder hornet thing everybody freaked out about yeah. so but then there's plenty of other things that are more harmful sorry yeah no i was um, gonna kind of give a scenario-ish thing but continue with what you were saying yeah i was just saying that like there's there's far more harmful things that are in the u.s currently that we really don't talk about mm-hmm. um in the public that i think people should be more aware of but, you know, whatever whatever people latch on to, like the murder hornets, yeah. they kind of blow out of proportion, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so we can talk about that a bit more. Yeah. But go on with what think, you're saying. I think that's a situation on how it is played. Because like, if you take something like the murder hornets, mm-hmm. first off, it ha- it's, it's named murder hornets. <laughs> and... Typically, both of those are not good things. Like, no, people do not like murder or hornets. Yeah, so they would super not like murder hornets. <laughs> Plus, yeah. this is a year of... The year 2020 is a year of bad luck, basically. True. Mm-hmm. A lot of things going wrong. And so they're... It's kind of one of those things of uh, what's next this is next Mm -hmm. and the marketing behind murder hornets it's you've got a time where people are just waiting for the news on what's the next bad thing going to happen and it's got an intimidating name however if you go into basically years past where we were from Mm -hmm. We have a lot of things that are, like, invasive, like, invasive species of turtles. That's right. So, first off, no turtle is going to have the same, I guess, terrifying appeal, for lack of better words. No, you can't call them murder turtles. Yeah, even murder turtle isn't as intimidating as murder murder hornet. (laughs) That's true. <laughs> I like the name, though. Yeah. If I ever find a cool-looking turtle, that's going to be the common name for sure. All right, you heard it here first. first. <laughs> um, so there's that. And these turtles are all over, but we also have a lot of native turtles as well. Mm-hmm. And they have a lot of similarities, similar niches. So people are, like, a lot less, I guess questioning it as compared yeah. to as murder hornets where it's like you'll get someone it's like i would say maybe one one in 50 people if you randomly mm-hmm. pull 
either has a pet turtle or tortoise or knows somebody with a turtle or tortoise. So it's mm -hmm. not a foreign concept. However, if you pull that same 50 people and ask, do you know anyone that keeps hornets as pets? I would, po I would probably put money that all 50 people would just be like, no, that's insane. <laughs> Who would do such a thing? Even beekeepers. They'd be like, what? Yeah. No. <laughs> How would I do that? The beekeepers would be mad. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a good point. I mean, that is one thing. The the turtles I've definitely dealt with probably the most of any of the invasive species of, like in my area, our area. Um, and the the average person... I think definitely would not be able to spot them because I mean, being able to tell the difference between a red eared slider and, and painted. like an Eastern painted turtle would be like impossible for anybody that hasn't like taken the time to learn the differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. While if you take a honeybee and a two inch long hornet from Japan then it'd be like, Hmm, I think I can, <laughs> I think <laughs> yeah, I can I spot can the difference here. Yeah. Hmm. One looks like a friendly guy that'll give me some food, and the other looks like it should be named Murder Hornet. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, I was, so invasive species clearly are not a foreign thing in the public eye. No. Um, but I think a lot of times there's a lot of misinformation that goes on. Either that we're not misinformation or lack of information i would say mm -hmm. um either we're not telling people enough or we're kind of uh aiming them towards the wrong thing yeah so like i said murder hornets although we did end up finding um like actual proof that there there are nests here um that's not initially as serious of an issue yeah initially it was just like there's just a few individuals they can be very harmful for honeybee populations, but it's like, uh, we, I, I don't think there's really anything going on. I don't think there's a huge chance of them spreading across the country mm -hmm. as we are right now. Yeah. But if you look at something like the spotted lanternfly, although that has a lot of attention, so I guess a better example would be like the emerald ash borer, which I feel like only certain groups of people would really hear about. Mm -hmm. Or um, Africanized bees, killer bees. Oh yeah, like that's that's a bee, that's a murder bee right there. <laughs> I mean, I, I I would argue that is far more dangerous than um, the Japanese giant hornets because those are actually spreading throughout the U.S. Yeah. and they definitely do kill people. Oh yeah. Um, and I don't like encounter a swarm of those guys. No, no, exactly. And there's just so many small things like that. That it's like we don't even uh, ever mention, or like most people would never even know about. Um, yeah. So that also gets into like the varying levels, I guess, of how dangerous an invasive species can be. Mm -hmm. Because I think what people focus on the most would be how does it affect humans? Yeah. Right. So. So. I think. Yeah. Go the on. I think for affecting humans, a perfect example would be the uh, the turtles we were talking about because mm -hmm. they don't really have an impact on like I mean I have pet a pet tortoise I've worked with turtles and tortoises but in my everyday life with the exception of my pet tortoise turtles have a very Min wild turtles have a um, very minimal impact on it where i would say most people could agree to that yeah, yeah. so it's like why why should be why should i be on the lookout for one if i see one just passing me like in the summer or i'm like by water in the summer and i just go oh it's like oh okay turtle i feel mm -hmm. like to the average person that would just be kind of a a situation of it's like there's a turtle that's pretty neat and then continue on your day without any questioning of any direct or indirect impact it has on the individual 
as opposed right. to if you see something like a giant nest of moths or lantern flies uh-huh. or giant scary hornets, I feel like that's going to have a lot bigger of an impact on the individual. Definitely. So there's like people's fear is definitely taken into account with how important is this invasive species like to me personally Mm -hmm. um like can it affect my health yes or no that plays a big part for the public um but invasive species can do so much more so these turtles are affecting the native populations which by you know competing for uh, resources and basking spots and all that um which is true for a lot of invasive species um that's usually the whole shtick is that they're kind of overtaking the niches of other animals in that area Mm -hmm. and then eventually pushing them out towards extinction which most people might not think would affect them personally but it can be very detrimental to the surrounding environment when then would affect um you know the whole area in all sorts of ways uh and then there's also the economic standpoint where this is a good example for the lanternflies. Lanternflies have a huge impact on agriculture for things like grapes and apples, all kinds of fruit, plants, maple trees, because um, they feed on that stuff. They feed on the sugar from those very sweet plants. Mm-hmm. So if you're like the head of a, of a, a winery, of a vineyard, lanternflies are probably a huge deal to you. Well, if you're just the average person, you've probably heard about lanternflies. Well, I think probably definitely there's been a huge push for them. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure why. That's something that's always kind of confused me. Because they're not the first invasive bug no, to not. really make an impact. But for some reason, they, they're really like out there in the news. Would you think, do you think that has an in that the impact that invasive insects have? over other things is because of the lot of there's a lot of negative stereotypes related to insects i think definitely i think the type of animal definitely has an impact on our view of it because one of the examples that um i've used before is the comparison between cats and uh burmese pythons Mm -hmm. because if you don't know and we'll definitely have a full episode on cats in general, That's, domesticated yeah, cats. That is on my list of episodes for the future is just cats. Because they are, I think, arguably the most invasive species, right? Next uh, to humans. Yeah, uh, I was going to say they're... Um, they were... I would consider them number two on the invasive species list after humans. Yeah. And we can talk about humans as an invasive species also. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, when it comes to cats, most people wouldn't refer to them as an invasive species because they're just cute little pets. They just happen to roam around the neighborhood. My I mean, cat likes to go outside. He needs to experience fresh air. Exactly. They're like, that's no big deal. But if you see a swarm of lanternflies on your tree, or if you're in Florida and you see these giant pythons crossing the road and swimming around the swamps, you're like, kill it. Kill it with fire. Yep. <laughs> and if there's that disconnect between it's like, well, both all of these things are invasive and they all have pretty serious impacts, some far more than others. Mm-hmm. But depending on what it looks like yeah. is how much I care about getting rid of it. Yeah. Because like with the cats, I have talk to a lot of people that have outdoor cats and things like mm-hmm. that they're just like oh but he likes going outside he like and it's domesticated so because it's domesticated i think that definitely gives a lot less of a danger factor to it than the insects and um like the pythons mm-hmm. where they're they could be tame but technically there are no domesticated species 
that's right. another future episode of de- domestication versus yeah, other terminology. True. It's very interesting. Um, but yeah, exactly. Um, so it's like defining an invasive species in the eyes of the public is very difficult because I feel like most researchers, conservationists, know what an invasive species is. They'd mm-hmm. say, well, it's not native to this area and it's causing problems. So it's an invasive species. But getting people to care about it is another thing. Yeah. If you have the emerald ash borer, which is a beetle that uh, kills specifically ash trees, mm-hmm. if you're not an ash tree farmer, that's probably not a huge deal to you. Nope. It does not affect Jimmy Bag of Donuts. <laughs> so you're like, why should I... What's um, the point of me caring about this little beetle if I only have maple trees in my yard mm-hmm. and oak, so it's not going not gonna to bother me? Exactly. People will be like, well, you know, why, why should I care about what's going on with, with this bug and this tree? And like, why... All right, now that we're on technical difficulty, I have yes. an invasive species decide I'm going to unplug the laptop. <laughs> Good old that laptops. happens. Um, but as we were saying about uh, why should I care about this, there's a lot of reasons to care, depending on, uh, I guess, the specific species we're talking about. But I, like I was saying, whether it affects people directly like uh, harm them physically or it affects the native environment it affects the economy it can do it can have all sorts of impacts that will eventually impact each individual person um i know people don't really like to look down the line that much because sometimes that's what you'll have to do like this thing probably won't kill you Mm -hmm. but you know, at some point, you're going to see some impacts. And even if it's just quality of life, I mean, if you live in an area where there are a lot of ash trees for the emerald ash borer, or there are a lot of maple trees for the uh, uh, spotted lanternfly, and then all of those trees eventually die, like, that's going to be kind of sad for anybody, I think. Like, suddenly this forest that you're used to seeing every day is now just like empty and dead and uh, think, and that can happen for all, all sorts of areas i think that you can kind of see from pretty much an objective standpoint on that how that kind of works out too because mm-hmm. if you look at if you look at the population along rocky mountains and coastal or like up north areas where it's very heavily forested there's some pretty big just populations of people, cities, things of that nature. Mm-hmm. However, if you look at places such as the Midwest, like Nebraska and Kansas, you've got mm-hmm. a couple major cities, and then it's just open. Yeah, and like, a straight farmland. Like the state of Wyoming doesn't have a lot going on in it Mm -hmm. and it's the least populated state despite it being bigger than some of the more heavily populated states but that also might be related to proximity to coastlines and things like that Mm -hmm. but it does have yellowstone which is pretty cool the yellowstone guy (laughs) i want to go someday Uh, it's great i highly recommend obviously it'd be tough right now but very, very cool. Uh, But back on the invasive species thing, yeah, so it will definitely impact the average person, whatever it is that you're talking about when it comes to invasive species. Um, And one of the points that I wanted to bring up kind of related to the spotted lanternfly is like, well, okay, what do we do about it then? Um, We have these plants, these animals that have established themselves in areas that they're not supposed to be in. They're thriving, um, and they're kind of taking over. What do what do we do? What does the average person do compared to what does the politician and the researcher do? 
And for the spotted lanternfly, there's been the movement to squish them. Mm-hmm. You know, every time you see a spotted lanternfly, squash it. Yeah. If you see egg cases on trees, destroy them. Um, and on that, I had a very interesting discussion with a friend of mine from school um, who thought maybe that isn't the right way to go about it. So what they were referring to was more on the ethical side. Okay. So if you think about it, um, like we said, there's a lot of different invasive species. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, so it's easy to push this message for spotted lanternflies because they're like a they're insect. Tiny. They're insects, yeah. Yeah, they're pretty visible. Like it's it's pretty easy to identify them. Um, and all people have to know is they're bad and they're not supposed to be here, and if you see them, squish them. But if you are an animal person or somebody who just kind of appreciates life in general, maybe you won't be as motivated to just kill something on site mm-hmm. purely for existing. Yeah. Like, it's because not the, the lantern fly's fault that it's here. No, exactly. And that's that's a comment I, I've heard a few times about different things, where it's like, it's not their fault that they're here. They you know, it's not their fault for existing. Mm-hmm. This is just a the situation they're in. So why do they need to suffer for it? Um, which I think is a, is a really solid point, something that maybe Jimmy would be uh, interested in discussing. Jimmy is interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Because it's it's right. I mean, from my like ethical standpoint, I I do agree. It's not it's not great to good kill to just stuff kill on sight. Yeah, that just feels bad. Mm-hmm. If for anyone, I think, or at least it should, unless you're just completely numb. Um, which I would say maybe maybe call somebody, but like. The the situation is, and I think conservationists in general have to deal with this a lot, is kind of weighing your options mm-hmm. and seeing the like the positives and the negatives and making sacrifices. Because yeah. I think that's one of the biggest differences between a conservationist and anybody like, else. And also like basically like your average animal rights activist. Yeah, is knowing that sacrifices need to be made mm-hmm. from time to time. And knowing what those, and you know, deciding what those sacrifices will be. Yeah. So in this instance, it would be killing the lanternflies mm-hmm. because they have so many negative impacts. You know, they're they're heavily destructive. Yeah, they're destroying the economy. They're spreading everywhere. They're really impacting a lot of people's lives. So it's like, oh, what else would you do? You know, you can't just catch them all and ship them back to to asia yeah. some part of asia that they're from um, that would also cause another negative impact if you really think about it if you just mm-hmm. have a sudden influx of a species regardless of where on the food chain it is mm-hmm. that'll lead to a very much a domino effect with how things react because it'll wipe out its food sources first, because say you just double the population. Yep. That'll use two times as much food. Although, Mm -hmm. if you think about it, that means that there will be more food for the predators of it. Yep. And they'll make two times as much. However, they'll reach a point where there's so many more predators that it won't that the population of lanternflies wouldn't be able to handle it, mm-hmm. thus wiping out their population. And then with the surplus of predators, that can lead to branching off to different preys, as well as just diminishing their population, kind of causing a like a wave after wave effect. Mm-hmm. Of. It's a boom and bust. Thank you. Uh, That's the word. Classic uh, diagram that you'll see, like with the increase in the prey, then you'll have an increase in the predators, then the prey drop, and then the predators drop, and it's back and forth over and over. So yeah, it would definitely, 
it could definitely have an impact like that. Um, and then little quiz for you. Mm-hmm. Your options for dealing with an invasive species that we've talked about so far, killing them, mm-hmm. which people are doing for the lanternflies or squashing them. And then for a lot of other things, hunting and yeah. fishing, people do, they set up these big um, events Mm-hmm. Like for they have a hunting season for Burmese pythons in Florida that I'm aware of. Um, they do big fishing events for uh, lionfish and carp. yeah, lionfish and carp. And uh, carp. The carp was the one I know about. Um, and those kind of situations, that's what they do. There's the option to push them somewhere else, mm-hmm. like we just talked about. But obviously, as you explained, that's... there are some drawbacks to that, mm-hmm. and also just like logistically you know if it was that easy that we could just scoop them all up and put them somewhere else it wouldn't we wouldn't even really have to deal with it you know it wouldn't be as big of a talking point if we could just say oh there's things here well let's just take them out like yeah that would be great if we could do that yeah um so what is another option for dealing with invasive species so uh... the one i have in mind is in reference to some toads. Okay, that's I was gonna say I'm gonna go the Jimmy Bag of Donuts route, oh. of and it's gonna lead to that of sure. why don't if they're already here and there's things that already eat them, why don't we just bring in things that eat them? Exactly. Why don't we introduce another new species to deal with this bad one? Well. Australia. Uh, yeah, Australia is the case study for that, yep. specifically the cane toad yep. and the cane beetle. So in Australia, back in the day, they were, well, they still do uh, farm sugar cane. Mm-hmm. And a big problem was the invasive cane beetle. That uh, there seems to be a pattern here with invasiveness and like beetles and insects. Yep. Probably oh, because they're just so easy to ship with stuff that we don't and realize it. Very easily slip into, because I'm not sure about your knowledge of like mm-hmm. cargo freighters, but those Small. boats. <laughs> nope, those boats are so massive. You'd have like shipping containers are probably half the size of my apartment, which and. There are hundreds upon hundreds of them on one of these boats. Mm-hmm. And I can't even find a cricket I drop on the floor half the time in my apartment. So trying to find a cricket or a beetle or a spotted lanternfly in the size of something that's, in theory, thousands of my apartment big, mm-hmm. it's not going to happen. No, and that's obviously how we get most of our invasive species is that globalization, the shipping of these crates that stuff gets into, and not only insects, you know, we've got rats, um, uh, mussels on the bottom of ships, like the zebra mussel. Zebra mussels. Um, Fish. Yeah, all kinds of things. Fish, yeah, definitely. That's how we get a lot of our stuff, and sometimes we introduce them ourselves. Yep. And to get back to it, yeah, that's that's what we did here. Is we introduced well, the Australians uh, did, I guess. Yeah, the Australians introduced, introduced the cane toad. toad. I said mm-hmm. first. Ah, dang it! Yeah. So with, <laughs> to take care of that cane beetle. Yep. And with that, it's one of those in theory, this seems like a good idea situations. So mm-hmm. like, why not bring something that'll eat it to take care of it? However you just s made the problem a step up on the food chain because yes you have these cane toads which are pretty big toads i've worked with some before and oh, they yeah. they can be quite large and so that already limits a lot of things that can eat them especially in a situation like australia where they don't really have the biggest animals on the block Minus no. their saltwater crocodiles. True. Um, however, there's also the cane toad's natural uh, defense mechanisms of mm. it is poisonous. Very. So it's uh, yeah, very poisonous. 
So with if something starts to eat them, um, odds are it's going to get sick and die because of the mm -hmm. poison. And one of, back in my animal educator days when I had a cane toad, I would hold up a big old toad that usually peed on my hand at some point um, and go, who would win in a fight? Five of these guys or a saltwater crocodile, the largest reptile on the planet. And everybody in the room would be like, saltwater crocodile. And then I'd laugh at them and tell them they're wrong. Because Classic. it's like, yes, a saltwater crocodile is more likely to eat something such as a toad more than it is to take care of a beetle. But then there's the aspect of what's the toad's natural defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need to be in the same locations as these crocodiles either. So relying on something like that to take care of a problem isn't exactly a solution. You just shifted your problem. That's right. So a cane toad's a perfect example of that because, I mean, with the poison and the natural ability of these toads to multiply at incredibly quick rates, um, they just exploded. I mean, they didn't even eat the cane beetle. No, that's, they ate everything that's the else. The toads will typically eat anything that can fit in the size of their mouth. Mm -hmm. And in a land filled with large insects, rodents, birds, you're you're taking me to a buffet. Yeah. Meanwhile, all the other animals that are like, wow, look at all these toads that I can eat. Nope. They'll just die. And now, you know, we've reached a point where nothing even tries to eat them. Yeah. They're, they're like, I know what that thing does. They've learned to have an aversion to it because either they have bad experiences or they've seen other animals have bad experiences and it's just kind of related to just issues upon issues and their entire species now that have gone extinct due to them mm -hmm. or have come very very close yep they've, so they've crippled lots of species by being introduced because of that solution which although it seems more natural than people just like outright squishing these beetles like with the spotted lantern flies we're not introducing a whole new species to just eat them mm -hmm. and having a new problem we're just squishing them and this is where the weighing things out kind of sits of i get in a in theory uh, just squishing them is less natural. However, if we went the natural route of introducing their predators, we'd have an Australia situation. Mm -hmm. And they are thinking of doing something similar right now. I don't know where the progress is currently, but I know there were plans to possibly introduce this uh, parasitoid wasp, um, which is... a uh, form of wasp that uh it's generally pretty small mm -hmm. that its whole uh thing is it's, it's a parasite so yeah. it'll like feed on usually one certain type of other invertebrate um well feed i guess in quotations because it will lay its eggs inside of this other animal and then, and then eventually they will hatch out and, and eat them and out. will and will kill the host. Um, so there's apparently a species, or a group at least, that focuses purely on spotted lanternflies, and that kind of keeps them under control. And spotted lanternflies are slightly different from cane toads in that um, they're not, like, inedible. Yeah. They're not super poisonous or anything. There are... We do have natural predators here that kind of take care of them. Most spiders, mm -hmm. uh, praying mantises, oh, yeah. things like that. that will eat them. I saw that over the summer. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's not like there's nothing here that could kind of take care of them, but the thing is they, they're they spreading so much yeah. that natural predators, just they can't deal with they those numbers. They can't keep up with it. So, 
they, uh, I say they kind of generally, but the researchers who were looking into this were basically saying that, you know, this species of wasp would purely go for spotted lanternflies because that's evolutionarily what they do. Um, but it's kind of hard to show that they're not going to have any sort of impact anywhere else, mm -hmm. you know? So people, even though the cane toad situation was kind of a disaster, it's still kind of an option when it comes to an invasive species is, well, what if we, what if we put something else there to deal with it? Um, so I don't know if it's just, we haven't learned our lesson or if we just kind of screwed up the first time, That'll but work. Hey, maybe this time it'll work. It's like, Last time was a fluke. This time it's going to be more controlled. Mm -hmm. And I think they're going to do something similar with uh, fire ants as well. Mm -hmm. I know fire ants are slowly but surely spreading through yep. the U.S. Um, fire ant eaters. That'll solve it. God, I wish. If we could import some giant ant eaters mm -hmm. into the U.S., oh, that'd be amazing. <laughs> um, but one thing I, w I want to bring up is... Um, oh god, I'm not about to blank on it, am I? I just had this great idea. Huh. Oh, okay. Um, so the the definition of an invasive species. Mm -hmm. So we said that it's uh, a species that is introduced to an area it's not supposed to be in, and it is harmful. Mm -hmm. How far does the distance have to be Ooh. for something to be considered non-native? I was actually gonna bring up this to you because we're running a little bit low on time so yeah i thought my, so my final question topic was it's pretty much the same exact um mm -hmm. i was gonna say like on what size scale does an invasive species happen because we've been talking a lot about uh, cane beetles go into Australia as well as yeah. cane toads and they're from the South, South America, America. Mm -hmm. and spotted lantern flies and murder hornets coming to the U S and they're from Asia. Mm -hmm. But how, so that's like a lot of it's macro. What is yeah. the micro habitat version? And if that's a thing. So I've always found it tough. Um, to define that because for example mm -hmm. you have the red-eared sliders that we talk about yeah uh the species of turtle that is present through um a lot of the u.s um but you know a lot in the northeast has been kind of spreading um at exponential rates taking over the habitat of all of our other native species but people don't really notice it and people don't really talk about it because the red-eared slider is native to the U S mm -hmm. and actually is from like the Southeast yep. part. So the U S and I think they're also, they also ended up in a bunch of other places too. I think like you can find populations of them in different continents. Like I, I've heard you could, there's some in like South Africa yeah, and like Australia. They're typically in, um, because, sliders are very involved in the pet trade and yeah pet that's industry. why they're invasive they're typically mm -hmm. in like temperate to a little bit more wetlandsy um environments wherever there is a decent sized pet trade or reptile meats tra industry yeah, and so they're pretty hardy. They can survive in a lot of different areas. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, they're originally native to southeastern U.S. So the fact that we see them in, like, the northeast or even kind of central U.S., people are like, well, is it, would that even be... Is that invasive, invasive? or is it just migratory? Because mm -hmm. if you look at things like patterns over time, animals don't stay in one place. An example is humans. We yeah. crossed the land bridge and we worked our way down. And I think kind of going for a case of the invasiveness is there is a direct correlation of fossil records of where there are 
early human remains and stuff, as well as the last known whereabouts of megafauna. Mm -hmm. And that's a direct correlation. So in th a lot of people are looking into the theory of humans directly wiping out megafauna. And it seems like a very concrete evidence but mm -hmm. it, that took thousands upon thousands of years I think yeah. a factor with the turtles is how quickly it's happening yes and also I think a lot of times um, you can you can see it as is it natural movement mm -hmm. or is it introduction and specifically for Edward Siders, I don't think there's much evidence to show that they're naturally moving northward yeah. or westward. Or I mean, they're not naturally moving to South Africa, that's for sure. Um, it's introduction. Yeah. So even though the distance isn't that far, it should still be considered invasive species because it wasn't there originally. Mm -hmm. It had to be um, manually put there. Yeah. And now it is spreading and causing problems. And other examples I can think of that um, would be like birds. Mm -hmm. And birds an, are another tough one because, like, well, birds fly, right? Yeah. So, uh, for example, the mute swan. Everybody loves swans, unless you've worked with a swan. Then you know they're <laughs> kind of jerks. <laughs> they're monsters. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're migratory. Mm -hmm. Originally, they're from parts of Europe. Um but they they do make their ways to like North America and I think yeah. parts of parts of Asia as well. Um, but in the U.S., for the most part, in North America, they're considered uh, an invasive species because there are just so many now. Like before, when they would be kind of a rarer sight, um, now they're just here forever, and they're all over the place, and they're so aggressive that they're scaring off a lot of other waterfowl and you could say the same for uh canada geese canada geese are migratory they're from canada mm -hmm. and they would come down to the u.s and uh other parts of the world but now there are populations that will live here full time that aren't migratory you've got canada geese that stay in the u.s year round yeah. it's like well is that an invasive species it's a tough call and um, kind of a point which I don't believe you brought up, and it's mm -hmm. not specifically related to birds, but it's like, what about civilizations? At mm -hmm. what point does, despite an animal living in this area, in, um, like, because we both live in pretty suburban areas, but it's like, what point does the animals start affecting the day-to-day -day of suburbia where it can be classified as invasive? Like, hmm. or, for example, like, there's farms and stuff. If you right. have, like in Texas, a wild boar problem. Yes. Sure, there are pigs that, certain types of pigs and swine that are found naturally in the area but mm -hmm. like they're causing a lot of problems because not only are they eating crops and affecting livestock but they're also transmitting disease so yeah. to kind of put it to where we are like we do have a lot of deer in this area and mm -hmm. while they're not the primary delivery system of like ticks um, they do deliver ticks as well as native mice and that mm -hmm. spreads things such as Lyme's disease so does that have a factor on what's classifying as invasive because it might not be directly affecting the environment it might not be directly kicking out other animals but they are introducing a lot of diseases and things that affect people so how does that make it in, does that make it invasive i think so well i mean as long as it's as long as it's a species that's not 
originally from that area. I think no matter what the effect is, if it is negative and that saying is not native, then that classifies as, as invasive to me. Um, I think that that makes sense, right? Yeah. But the, like, so like on. kind of going to the Jimmy Bang of Donuts uh, point of view, like right. there are native deer in this area. Yes. As well as things like we'll occasionally get a black bear in this area. Right. And the average person in this area is not equipped to handle an encounter with a black bear, despite odds are the black bear running away. So that disrupts people's livelihoods if it's found near any sort of store or even residential area. Mm -hmm. That's just... It might be a very minimum impact for a short amount of time, but that is negatively affecting these people's lives. Mm -hmm. So does that make it invasive because it is starting to affect the human population based off of that? I would say no, because A, I would say the bear was here first, or the deer. Um, and the, the way to actually look at it is the real negative impact the species that is impacting the most in those areas are the people mm -hmm. that is the true invasive species because they're the ones disrupting the environment and causing these close encounters because if we weren't here um building all these things destroying natural habitat and slimming down the resources we wouldn't be seeing these animals as much um and that, you know, that can be with bears, with mountain lions, with all, all kinds of animals. We would not be seeing them as much if we, the true invasive species, mm -hmm. weren't affecting them as much. So I think really you just have to kind of flip the, the script there and say, no, these animals are the native species. We are the invasive, disruptive ones. Hmm. But and, uh -huh. what... But this is where the spotted lanternfly situation comes in again. Sure. Where I can borderline guarantee most people in these parts weren't the ones that established the civilizations. We're doing what we as people know how know what to do. Mm -hmm. We're getting married, having the three kids, and... We're just living our lives as oil tycoons. Um, mm -hmm. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm just going through my natural life cycle, like the spotted lantern flies, despite not natively being there. Right. So would it be more of a case of being invasive or being considered invasive? Or mm -hmm. would it be kind of a, a, I guess the word I want to use is accustomed to, like situation. So the question there is how long does something have to be in yes. an area to no longer be considered invasive? There we go. That's, that's the real question I'm asking, mm -hmm. but done correctly. <laughs> <laughs> and that question is incredibly difficult to define. Um, define. Because a classic example of that, I would say, would be the dingo in Australia. Mm -hmm. Because the dingo is not native <sighs> to Australia. I know, huge shock. Like an iconic animal for Australia. Mm -hmm. But no, it is not in fact native. It is not, I think, technically a species of wild dog. I think it is um, basically a type of domesticated dog that then became not domesticated. Uh, yeah. You know, they people. I think it's descended from the dole in India, um, which is so. a, a type of somewhat domesticated dog um, that was brought to Australia and then is just kind of roamed free. Um, and obviously, letting loose a carnivore is always going to cause problems, it's like in a non-native area. Um, so initially, I have no idea what kind of impact dingoes had when they were first brought there. But I, initially, I would say they were definitely invasive species. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, they've been there for how many thousands of years? 
can you really call them invasive? The first I don't record know. of a dingo, by the way, is uh, 1623. That's the first record of a dingo? So, uh, well, that would be the first time that's, somebody like... That's the first time it's recorded. Yeah. Not the some first time it was there. European or whatever came over and said, that's a dingo. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so the question is, like, well, then what's what's the time span? And I would say... I, th- I think it's a hotly debated topic, but I would say that it would have to reach a point where the environment is in a more, I'm not going to say purely stable, because I don't know if you can ever say an environment is stable, or like mm-hmm. an ecosystem is stable. But I think it's constantly fluctuating. Oh, yeah. um, it would be when it is in a mostly stable situation. So the dingo as it is now in its environment pretty chill right Mm -hmm. like everything that's in that area with it they're aware of each other's existence and they you know interact however they do cassowaries versus dingoes yes yes exactly um a lot more terrified of a cassowary in all honesty (laughs) I, i think most people should be if they're not um but the situation that we see the most is kind of the initial introduction and the ecosystem sorting itself out. Um, so with all of the species that we've, that we've talked about, we're seeing the declines in other species. We're seeing tree populations dying off or other insects, other turtle species, whatever it may be. We're seeing a huge decline and that is not going to be happening in a somewhat stable ecosystem. So it's very clear, like, this thing that wasn't here before that is here now is having a negative impact, and the ecosystem is collapsing. If we <coughs> if we weren't seeing that, because they've been there for however long, then I think you could consider it not invasive, because it's no longer having a severe negative impact on anything else in its shared ecosystem. But I don't know how long it would take to see that, and also there's no guarantee that the ecosystem would eventually reach that kind of even point. Mm -hmm. There's a very good chance for a lot of these things that just completely crashes, which is obviously the worst case scenario, but that's what uh, researchers and conservationists are going to talk about to get people to do something about it. Because we want things to be the way they are, the way that we have yep. known them to be. Yep. All right. Uh, which is another topic to talk yep. about one day, but I think that's a good place to end it, right? So, because this is definitely going to be the first of many episodes on invasive species. Yes. Uh, there's so many aspects to talk about. Mm-hmm. What? So instead of doing like we do with our guests, where we give what are their top three tips. I would say, right. what would be, at this moment, your number one tip on invasive species? Like, if they can only think, if they can only remember one thing from this episode, what would the one thing you want them to be? Hmm. I would say, it sounds really generic, but I would say do your research. Mm-hmm. Know what's in your area like what's native and what's not, and just be aware of that. I think people having knowledge of the th- things living in their in their area gives them a lot more insight into like what the situation is with their environment. Because, like I said, if I take someone who's not really knowledgeable about it, we go outside and I say, "Oh, see that stink bug? That's not native." You see that praying mantis that's from china these earthworms these night crawlers the big ones they're not supposed to be here and you just go on and on and on and that kind of you know gives people a brain blast they're like what all of these things that i've known for so long they're not actually supposed to be here that's crazy yeah um so that would be my thing is just research all the plants and animals in your area what's supposed to be there and what's not and i think it'll give you a lot more it'll make you think really it'll make you kind of more passionate probably about wanting to do something or no more at least 
I would say my take home fact, because I'm not going to choose the same one as you of do your research. Right. Would be something on the lines of if you think. I'm actually going to go a little bit to a topic that we haven't talked about today, and I Mm -hmm. feel like we're going to get into a topic that it'll be in a different episode or even multiple different episodes of Mm -hmm. if you are getting a pet, be prepared to take care of it its entire life cycle. That's a good point. Because that is a very common lead up to things we talked about a hint with the sliders sliders Um, cats yeah and cats but the answer if you are unable to take a like take care of a pet anymore the answer is not set it free yeah definitely no matter what it is the option is never release it Mm -hmm. the answer is There are plenty of rescues, breeders, anything in between, even other people that will be more than happy to take things in. Yeah, I'll take it. Well, I guess it depends on what it is. Yeah, that's true. It's like a reptile or amphibian or something. I'll take it. I got you. I have a handful of rescued reptiles and amphibians already. And Yeah, I've uh, I've got two rescues right now. All right, Calum, finish this Mm -hmm. off. Cool. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed this uh, somewhat rant, but kind of informational session on invasive species, non-native species, and what to do with them. I think it's very clear that we have more to say, and we could talk about this for a long, long time. And if anybody has anything that uh, they would want to be talked about more, if they heard something in this that they found really interesting or something we didn't talk about that you want to hear mentioned, uh, please let us know. As we said, we'll happy to... we mm-hmm. are planning on making a couple more episodes of Invasive Species alone. Oh, yeah. So uh, Let us know. Let us know what you want to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you have any comments on some of the stuff we said, if you have any other viewpoints that you want brought up, definitely let us know as well. Uh, but until then, we will... See you in the next episode on whatever we talk about. Who knows? We don't. (laughs) No, no, we don't.